Good afternoon, everyone. In today's Gospel, our Lord asks probably one of the most important questions in the entire Bible. He turns to his disciples and he says, Who do the crowds say that I am? Of course, the Lord knew who he was, but he wanted to know what they thought of him. Now today, if our Lord was to step out into the marketplace, if you will, on the street and begin asking people, who do you say that I am? He probably would get diverse answers. Some would respond that the Lord Jesus is simply a powerful human being, a superman of sorts, someone that we would admire, but not necessarily follow. Others might answer and say, well, the Lord Jesus is just a great teacher, a professor. We'll listen to him, maybe debate him, but not follow. Others might see in Jesus a great social activist, a great defender of the poor. They might want to help him in those activities that they feel most comfortable yet not truly follow him. The great British essayist Charles Lamb was once asked, who is the greatest literary genius of all time? Was it Shakespeare or was it Jesus? And Charles Lamb answered by saying, I'll tell you the difference between those two men. If Shakespeare walked into this room right now, we would all rise to greet him. If Jesus walked into this room, we would all fall down and worship. There's the difference. There is the answer to the question. And so when our Lord turns to his own disciples and asks them personally, well, all right, who do you say that I am? It's Peter who answers correctly. It's Peter who gives the answer for all those who want to not just simply admire Jesus, think him to be a great historical figure, a superman, a social activist, a professor. No, he's more than that. He's different. Peter says that he is the Christ of God, the anointed one. But you know, our Lord doesn't leave Peter and the apostles with just simply that answer. Because it doesn't fully reveal who he is. So our Lord makes them realize that this title, the Christ of God, also involves the cross. He goes on to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly. He's the one whom we heard about in our first reading from the prophet Zechariah, that we will look upon him whom they have pierced. Do you see what our Lord is doing? Do you see he's trying to tell them that my identity at the heart of who I am is the cross. And if you're going to follow me, if you want to be one of my disciples, if you and I want to be Christians, we must be like Christ whose identity is centered around the cross. Why? Is this some sort of, if you will, spiritual masochism that we like suffering for suffering's sake? No. No, the cross is the part of Jesus' own identity. And it's a part of who we are as Christians simply because the path of love is always the path of suffering. Let me repeat that. Think about our world today. The logic of divine love means automatically, always, a path of the cross, a path of suffering. Because did not God, in the midst of our 
distorted world, a world distorted by sin, a world which includes the disharmony of vice, a world and our own individual world which is is, is affected by the disintegration of evil. Did he not take all of that to the cross? Did he not in the cross reshape it all into an empty tomb? A tomb that brings forth new life, new harmony, true peace. So the way to love, the way to peace, whether it's interior or exterior, is always the way of the cross. You know, if we look inside ourselves, we see that disharmony, don't we? It's the result of original sin. If we realistically examine our conscience, we can see that, yes, you and I, in a very distorted way, want comfort, pleasure. We want everything for the self. Now, those things in and of themselves are not bad, but when we seek them as the highest good, when our life becomes centered around them, that's sin. That's evil. So love is then going to cost something of us. If we're going to overcome this interior world of distortion and sin, it's going to mean the cross. You know, when I was living in Spain and learning the Spanish language, I was always fascinated by a particular phrase that they would use a lot. When everything, when something was very difficult for them, they would always say, ah, they'd say, me, me, me cuesta. They'd say, me cuesta. Which literally means, it costs me. There's a price. So when it was difficult, they'd say, me cuesta, me cuesta. I think that's a good way to think of it. For yes, to truly love, to truly be good, to truly follow the divine path, it's going to cost something. It is the cross. And even in our exterior world, we see this distortion of sin. We see that if we try to live this way of God, others will think that we're a bit crazy, a bit off kilter, kind of odd. The way of love in the world is also going to be a way against the grain, against the movement of our society and culture. One example of this is something that we are meditating on and praying for during this week leading up to really the 4th of July. It's a week and a half or so. And that is that the United States bishops have called for once again a fortnight for freedom. Precisely because in our society there have been grave threats against our freedom of religion. There have been, especially most recently, this basic right of ours being eroded including by our own government. Christians go against the grain. In order for us to stand up and live according to our faith, yes, it would involve the cross. And we are feeling it now. We are hopefully all familiar with the fact that the Health and Human Service mandate is still in effect. And this mandate, despite the accommodations that have come from the federal government, continues to define a religious employer in such a narrow way that even Mother Teresa's sisters could not be an exception to paying in health insurance for abortion, sterilization, and contraception. They have so narrowly defined what it means to be a religious institution and employer Basically, it means that Catholic hospitals continue, Catholic, Catholic um, institutions like universities, including Catholic dioceses, and individuals who own businesses and object to paying in their health insurance for what they believe to be immoral practices, they cannot seek an exemption to the health and human service mandate. That's why right now there is, in all federal courts around our country, there are lawsuits brought about by individuals who own businesses, by Catholic dioceses, Catholic hospitals, Catholic universities, that are saying that this is not right. This is an erosion of our religious liberty. We should have the right to act according to our conscience. 
and in accord with our faith. But yes, we have the cross to bear in this. Yes, we must fight for our most basic freedom, the freedom of religion. It is a path of the cross. We need not worry. We need to take up this fight because it's precisely what the Lord asks us to do. Does he not say in the gospel today, take up your cross daily and follow me. This is a part of who we are as Christians because it's a part of who Jesus is. Follow Jesus, of course, in the path of love. But we will also find in that path the cross that we lovingly embrace. The world will always be a bit off kilter. We too, in our inner world, are a bit off kilter. We might seem to be a bit crazy. We will have to struggle against our own sinfulness. But with Christ, the Christ of God, Jesus our Lord and Savior, we will have the strength to bear whatever cross there is, knowing that we are acting like him who is the Christ of God.